can control this money, which comes out of your own tuition, and spend it on stuff like this, where you like pay a dude from Instagram to talk about himself, and then you buy a shit ton of donuts. That seems really awesome. So, um, you know, if you're in Comedy Track or if you're just interested at all, please talk to them after this. Um, it's a really cool opportunity. And I don't really talk a lot about school on this talk, but when I was an undergrad, um, seven years ago, eight years ago, uh, I had like three campus jobs. I was in like three different student orgs. I had, I was like the annoying person. You know how there's like an annoying person on campus who's always doing a lot of stuff and like giving you handbills on the quad and stuff? That was me. People talk shit about me on like private Facebook groups, <laughs> which were then like screenshots of me. Like I was not popular, but I was busy. And, and I like to think that that like the foundation for where I'm at now. So we're gonna do this. I don't really know where I'm sitting. It's not a poetry slam. <laughs> kind of wish it was, that'd be cool. Um, talking about feelings, hello. My name is Adam J. Kurtz. I'm a artist, author, designer, illustrator thing. And uh, I thought we would talk about feelings. So talking about feelings, it's actually the name of this zine that I made seven years ago. And we all know what zines are, right? Because we go to art school. Yeah. Cool. Sometimes I say zine, and there's like one or two people who are like, what is that? Um, I made this, this personal zine. It was just full of like my little stuff that I wanted to make. And uh, at the time, there was literally no way to know that this was going to define my entire career. <laughs> career wasn't even a word that I was like thinking about. You know what I mean? Because you go to school, and you learn a bunch of stuff, and you really think you know what you're gonna do with your life and then you graduate and you're like, oh, I actually do not know anything. I am a dumbass. <laughs> you get all these skills and all these tools and then day one of the real real world, it's like you almost forget everything really quick. And then you, you bounce back, don't be terrified. You do very quickly bounce back. But I, I made this zine not knowing what would happen to me uh, and I can't wait to show you a little bit about what has happened since, um, you know, in the last seven to nine years of being a great person on this earth. But if you don't know who I am, that's fine, because I'm not particularly relevant. So if you came to this for the donuts, or because your friend tagged you in an Instagram post, or just because you saw like 10 different sides with my name and an arrow just now, um, <laughs> hi, my name is Adam J. Kurtz. I was a kid once. Then I was a teen, it was uncomfortable. Uh, I am Canadian. I believe that women are people sort of controversial opinion for some reason. Um, I was on SNL once, by mistake. <laughs> I was walking to work one day and I was like, is that Bobby Moynihan? <laughs> uh, I really like Michelle Branch. I don't know if you remember who she is from the early 2000s. Love Michelle Branch, uh, really quick. Oh. That's, his, that's her as well, so that's me at like 15 meeting her, and then that's me at like 23. Uh, I love bread, I fucking <laughs> love bread. Oprah and I are very similar in that way. It's the only thing I share with her. And uh, I very recently uh, made this book called Things Are What You Make Of Them. It's my third sort of illustrative book um, about the creative process and mental health. Um, and it was on Ad Week. I don't know. I just put a screenshot to like ascribe a sense of legitimacy to myself, <laughs> just at the top of the talk. Graphic designer Adam J. Kurtz has built his portfolio on uplifting but slightly cheeky missives printed on brightly colored objects, ranging from balloons to books. Uh, cool Hunting wrote that sort of very succinct uh, description of what I do. Uh, this is actually a couple years ago, and I still like it, so it's in the slide. Uh, what I'm here to talk to you about is personal work and my personal work. And so for me, my work is really about honesty, humor, and a little bit of darkness. And that's that's how I describe it to people. If you've seen some of it before, you're like, yeah, no, I see that. You're Jewish, I get it, it's all there. <laughs> um, personal work is important. And so I think a lot of us have a sense of what personal work is, but for those of us who kind of don't know exactly what I'm talking about, we have coursework that we do because it's assigned to us. And there's professional work that you do because your client told you to or your boss told you to, and you do that for money. And both of those things can be really cool and incorporate your voice and be a shade of who you are in your work. But personal work is different. Personal work is that thing that you make because you just kind of have to make it. Personal work is that thing that you make because you want it to exist, so you make it exist. 
And I think it's really important, and uh, we're gonna talk about it. So this is us in the room. These are things that, as creatives, we maybe aspire to be titles that we want. De designers, art directors, copywriters, illustrators, authors, bloggers, social media stuff, the list sort of goes on and on. Usually I make a joke that the list is continued, but the screen is too small. But this is like a very big screen. <laughs> so the joke doesn't work. Um, bear with me as I open a water really uncomfortably. There's nothing like a fresh Aquafina brand water beverage. Uh, I actually did sponsor content for PepsiCo before. I was about to say that I had it, but I guess they own me. Um, but the thing, that, the thing that unites all of these titles, all of these sort of career goals, uh, positions, professional, whatever you want to call it, is communication. Communication is sort of the thing that unites all the different things that we do. And so I know people in this room are from different disciplines or have different focuses or different aspirations for what you want to do next, but communication is the thing that unites all of that. And, uh, and sometimes that's a little bit terrifying because you're like, oh, how can I best communicate this? How can I enunciate this idea? If you're a graphic designer, which is sort of where I began my journey, uh, you know, graphic design is co combining text and image to effectively communicate something, some message. And, and that's really what it is uh, in the sort of truest sense. So my best advice, figure out what you're saying and then fucking say it. That's it. Figure out what you're saying, say that thing, congratulations, done. You did it. Fantastic. Um, and that's sort of when we're talking about communication and design in this sort of professional space. To me, personal work usually falls a little bit more into that art territory, right? It's we're making stuff that doesn't need to exist for any reason other than we want it to. But I think the process is actually very similar. It is also figure out what you're saying and say it. So this is how I define art. And uh, I know that we're in an art school and the more times I say the word art, the more of you are like cringing into your like <laughs> turtlenecks. I get it. <laughs> Shout out to the turtleneck. Um, I get it, like art is a horrifying word. It took me like 10 years to like say that word without cringing. Later in the talk, you're gonna hear more words that I can now say without cringing. Feel something and then create work that will evoke that emotion in others. To me, that's what art is. And it's very simple. And it's a very broad definition because I think, I think art is a really broad thing. We kind of know that. Art is, I experienced something or I felt something and now I'm making work that reacts to that, that reflects that, that magnifies that, that in any way at all is derivative of that first feeling, and I'm trying to communicate it to other people. And with that definition, a lot of things are art. You know, we, we kind of get that like a sculpture is art, although the definition of sculpture has changed since I first heard that word. Um, but by this definition, like if your mom texts you a photo of a beautiful sunset, that's art. If there's a rainbow over Manhattan and like every single like person that you follow on Twitter tweets it, that's art. I don't know, do you all follow like a lot of people on Twitter? Do people use Twitter anymore? Is it just me? Do I have a problem? <laughs> I follow like the cool like media writers of New York. Do you know what I mean? There's like 10 cool people and they're all friends with each other. And I remember this one day they all posted a rainbow and I was like, damn. <laughs> I didn't post a rainbow because I didn't go outside. <laughs> personal work is personal. It should be personal. It's in the name. Um, so a lot of times we see projects that are shared online where it's like, this is a personal project I've been working on, and it's like, that personal project just seems like work. That's like a fully fledged book that has been published by somewhere. Like, this is a full film where you launched a record label. And I get that those are sort of sometimes tangential to our professional practice. But when I say personal work, I'm talking about like really personal little stuff that's not a big deal and it's super easy and anyone can do it. So. Personal work should be truly personal. And I'm also, when I say personal work should be personal, I'm, I'm not encouraging you to do like sort of that clickbait personal work. You know that personal work that's like, I took a picture of myself every day for 10 years <laughs> so that you would subscribe to my Behance profile. It's like, I don't mean to drag Noah Colleen, I think he's cool, but you know what I mean. Just make stuff because you wanna make it. I feel like I'm really ranting on this. I gotta speed up through this part. Personal work helps us identify what matters. I think one of the most important things about personal work and why we should do it is because it helps us figure out what matters to us, right? Because personal work is something that we do because we want to. So what do you want to make? The thing that you want to make is the thing that matters to you. If you're not feeling an intense drive to do something in your free time, 
then it probably doesn't matter to you. And personal work helps us find our voice because it challenges and pushes us to propel ourselves forward, to figure out how to best be heard using those communication skills that we, we have from, from classwork, from internships, from professional work, using all those skills to communicate our thing, our ideas, what we have to say. And in that way, it really sort of like funnels us into the best possible way that we can use our skills to amplify our voices. Um, and that's something that through repeated projects starts to feel a little more natural to you. And so a lot of people say, trying to find my voice as a creative person or like I'm trying to find my aesthetic, like what's my deal? You will get there, but you will get there through doing a lot of work. And the easiest way to do a lot of work is to be your own client by doing personal work. So here's some truly personal work that I've created. These are things that I just wanted to make so I made them and it was not a big deal. And there was no boss and there wasn't really a budget. It was just like, hey, this would be cool. Okay, do it. It's like these sort of snap decisions to just make things. And sometimes it's really literal. Like I'm not a very smart person. You know what I mean? There's not a lot of nuance. So for example, um, I have a lot of feelings. I think we can all relate. So I made a bottle of feelings. <laughs> this is extremely literal. Um, I really concepted and created this uh, very sort of abstract illustrative work in, uh, in like 20 fucking seconds. <laughs> and, and I made it into a pin uh, and people really liked it. And so if, if it, you know, if people like it, that's, that's good. So I made this pin and I did a sticker, I did a patch, I did an art print, and then I did a physical ceramic feelings jar that you can get at Fish's Eddy in the city. Um, and there are actually, the show just came down. The Museum of Design Atlanta had 99 bottles of feelings on the wall. And literally at the opening, someone was like, oh, why are there 99 bottles on the wall? And I was like, I don't know how to explain this to you. <laughs> you're either with me or you're gonna have it. Um, but again, this, this was not like a super complex thing. I just wanted to make this, so I just did. Um, and it was completely fucking crazy when Urban Outfitters wholesaled like 3,000 of them for their stores. And it's not like Urban Outfitters said, hey man, like we're commissioning this work from you. Absolutely not, it was me being like, hey, it would be funny to make 50 pins and see what happens. And what happened was like a lot of good stuff. Sorry I'm such an asshole. Uh, this is a balloon that I made. This is one of the first personal projects I ever did. And obviously graphic designers in the house know that this took me about five fucking seconds as well. <laughs> uh, center align type, like this is, a, you do not need to like, you don't even need to go to art school for this. <laughs> um, so I, let me just like step out here so you can all see me. Can everyone kind of see me right now? You get it, I'm like, Funny, I'm like relatively handsome, but I have some problem areas. Uh, so typically in a relationship, I get dumped. That's just like, that's my role in the relationship. If someone else dumps me, that's fine. Because, it, you know, if it happens enough times, you kind of embrace it. But I had to break up with someone because uh, he was a fucking train wreck. And I can say that confidently. Um, I won't go into why. Uh, so I, I felt really bad about it. I was like, wow, breaking up with people sucks, actually. This is like really painful. I do not like being on this side of it. So I made these balloons, and uh, the minimum order was 500 balloons. So I have 499 balloons, and I'm like, now what? And I posted them on Tumblr, which was sort of a uh, like image and text sharing website that used to exist. Uh, <laughs> sort of like a precursor to uh, the social media landscape as we know it now. Um, and, and people started buying them. I had like a little PayPal link and it got written up in design blogs and it was on Complex, it was on Swiss Miss, and I was like, wow, am I famous? Huh. <laughs> I remember being like, wait, what? Um, to be fair, I was very high in that period of my life, so like everything was kind of a surprise to me. And I was like, were those noodles there the whole time? Based on the true story. What is this? I've seen it on Tumblr. <laughs> What is this? It seems so familiar. Uh, you know the thing when you're about to fall asleep and then you just like have a funny idea and you just quickly do something? I very quickly photoshopped this on a blank t-shirt, posted it to Tumblr, and I had this text that says, now accepting pre-orders. And for it to be really funny, that had to be a hyperlink, right? So you gotta like put in a URL. But I was not accepting pre-orders, I was going to bed. So I linked to the Google search result for the word no. And I went to bed. And I wake up the next morning, 
and I had 5,000 reblogs overnight. And I had all these emails, and it was like, you know, hey man, um, come on in, don't worry about it. So I, I woke up and I had these emails that were like, hey man, and uh, oh, that's my straight guy voice. You all got that, right? Like, hey man. Um, sorry if there are any straight men here, it's not your fault. Uh, you're still you, and um, don't let anyone take your sparkle away. Straight guys, you're all right. Um, I mean, they're fine, right? They're fine. It's their choice. Um, hey man, your link's broken. I want to pre-order the shirt. I'm like, the link's not broken. It's a joke. But people kept asking for the shirt, and so I was like, all right, I'm going to give the internet what they want. And I, I did accept pre-orders, and I sold 350 t-shirts. 350 shirts. I paid my rent for three months with t-shirts. I live in Williamsburg. That's crazy. Um, and then, the craziest part of all, the original designer of that Joy Division album cover, Peter Seville, uh, was asked about the t-shirt in The Guardian. One, that's already crazy, how does The Guardian know? Two, he said, it's brilliant, isn't it? Profoundly clever. And I was like, damn, he's not gonna sue me. And, you know, of course, it's actually a joke about appropriation on the internet and also like the original art was from a textbook. It was already a sort of free domain when he used it back then. Um, you don't have to necessarily know all that to just think it's a funny t-shirt. Um, ultimate sort of final gut punch irony, uh, I tried to license this to Urban Outfitters because I just thought if they sold it, that would be hysterical. They were not totally on board with that joke. <laughs> they were like, cool, but if like you have any other ideas, I was like, no. Everything will be so good so soon, just hang in there and don't worry about it too much. This is a post-it note that I wrote because a friend of mine was in an accident, she's fine now. One time I told, uh, Sophia, you were at the van store thing, right? Yeah. That was the time. So my friend Sarah Jean was hit by a motorcycle and was badly injured. And that's why I wrote this, was to like text her a little greeting. But when I told this story at the van store, she was there. And everyone in the room was like, <gasps> you know, your friend. <gasps> and she just sort of raised her hand. She's like, I'm fine, guys. <laughs> so now I like to say that up top, like, she's fine. But I made this post-it note. And at the time, I didn't really think much about it. Um, and at the time, I was still doing like sort of that like cooler, like, I'm sad art. Like, I'm edgy. <laughs> Um, and I was really sort of overthinking a lot. And what I like, I know, there was a time when like, I thought I was edgy, that's bizarre. Um, there was a time when I didn't know it was okay to just make nice things that people like. And it took me a really long time to get there. This is sort of like this ubiquitous, positive, popular thing that people like. It ends up all over the internet. People on Etsy printed on their stuff. Lena Dunham posted it without credit, that's fine. <laughs> she later credited me, slid into my DMs. This was before she was like highly problematic, so at the time I was really excited. Now I'm like, I don't know her. Um, but this taught me that it's just, it's okay to make nice things that people like. And that's not really necessarily like an art school lesson, because here we're doing smart things. But in the real world, it's actually okay to just have a nice day. So, pro tip, when you get out there, just have a nice day, have a nice time, make something cute, you know, draw a heart with a smiley face on it, because some days you're going to need that. Um, and this was a really good lesson for me to learn. However, people can feel on some level when you're faking, and it's important to remember that. I can do a little cutie pie post-it note because I have been making work that is very blunt, very direct, and, and very much about my feelings positive and negative. If you just show up on day one with like a positivity meme Instagram account, I don't know. I don't know if that's good. I don't know if people are gonna believe you. And so when like a powdered green juice company steals my work and puts it on their Instagram as part of their like brand building strategy, it feels kind of gross. And you're just like, I don't want powdered green juice today. <laughs> So, so keep it, keep it real. <laughs> I struggle to say that phrase because I'm like the wise person alive, but like, keep it real. <laughs> you guys, I'm from Canada, I'm like, I'm like a mess. Um, but it's really important to just, to be, be as yourself as you can. And I know that that's really hard when you're not 100% sure who you are, who you are, but owning the fact that you're not 100% sure of who you are is being honest. So that's part of that, that's okay. Um, but please don't just like do a thing that seems trendy and like 
wait for people to love it. Because if it doesn't fit in the context of who you are and what you do, everyone's gonna know that you're kind of lying. So I have an online gift shop where I sell like pins and patches and other accessories, pencils, obviously you saw those balloons. And the packaging itself sort of discusses some of the reasons why people give gifts. And so for me, I've had this internet gift shop for like eight or nine years. And it started as this exploration of why do we keep souvenirs at all? Why do we keep trinkets? Why do I have a keychain that my grandmother gave me when I was eight years old? It's because those things, while not explicitly valuable, take on a tremendous value when they're given to us by people we love, right? That's like, that love adds value to an object and sort of transmutes it into an heirloom. That's what an heirloom really is. And so I'm always thinking about that sort of thing. And I know you're seeing this and you're like, yeah, okay, that's a mean bitch. But like, <laughs> to me, it's elevated to art thanks to the emotional value of gifting. <sighs> I'm like so fun to talk to at a party, I swear. <laughs> Here is a set of pins that I made, the Honest Meds pin set, because I feel like in like, nod your head or silently screaming your head if you're with me, uh, anxiety and depression are somehow like super trendy. Those are like cool mental illnesses to like have a cute hat about. And I'm just like, what about bipolar and psychosis though? Like, when are those gonna be trendy? Like, I'm waiting to be cool. Let me know. So I made this set that represents the sort of four types of mental illness. And each one is modeled after an actual medication for each one and sort of has a very literal explanation of what that medication is meant to do to the person who takes it. And I made these to raise money for mental health charities, uh, the Brain and Behavior Research Foundation and Mental Health America. And this is something that if Urban Outfitters put out, you would be like, die bitch. Absolutely <laughs> not, do not. But if I do this after eight years of being really open about mental health issues and using this sort of simple tongue-in-cheek humor to address that, you're like, oh yeah, he's that guy. And so when I did this, no one was mad at me. <laughs> if almost anyone else did this, right? It's like, thank you. No one's ever applauded at this slide before. Um, you know, at a certain point, you establish what your voice is, and then people believe you. People are there with you, and they don't want to fight you on it. And that doesn't mean that you do eight years of work and then you can do some ignorant bullshit. But if it's in line with the things that you've been saying and is done in a way that is compassionate, understanding, and, and listening to other people, then it's okay. I love you like I love my coffee first in the morning or last in the night, dark or sweet, or both right now and later and always and constantly. <sighs> did you know, you're a little young, so probably some of you don't even know this yet. Uh, did you know that love is real? <laughs> Isn't that fucking crazy? <laughs> love is actually real. So you heard about it, like your mom loves you, which like you get, like of course your mom loves you or your dad loves you, people in your family love you, but love is a real thing and in life you can meet someone not related to you who doesn't owe you anything and you can choose to love them so much that you would die for them. <laughs> it's ridiculous! Um, I didn't know that love was real because, you know, I'm like uh, an adult baby and I'm like emotionally stunted. I just like didn't know that love was real until December 1st, 2012 when I met this dude and I was like, oh, <laughs> wait a minute, I get it now. And um, then in, uh, in January 2013, I made this coffee mug and I have since done several different colorways. Uh, I licensed the Arturban Outfitters. Urban Outfitter is one of those things that I can say without cringing now. I told you there'd be more of them. Urban Outfitters, Urban Outfitters, see? Totally fine, I'm not even right. Uh, here's the thing. So you meet this guy, he's from Canada, he's Jewish, 6'2", blue eyes, he's a graphic designer, he makes zines, relatively handsome, although he does have some problem areas. Things are going well, and then two months into the relationship, he mass produces this mug. <laughs> That's a red flag. Get out of the relationship. That is not, that's not okay. That's not healthy. But uh, he did it. And actually, we just got married three months ago. Thank you. Um, we got married just so that joke would have an ending. Um, <laughs> 
we were talking about that last night. I was like, babe, the joke is actually, you know that joke about the monkey? He's like, yeah. I'm like, it's better now. He's like, great. Cool. Um, love, love is real, and that is very strange. Uh, another sort of like core thesis of all of my work is that love is real, every pop song is good. Selena Gomez is a genius. Thank you, you're welcome. <laughs> I am a tool or a weapon and completely free, which is literally terrifying. Do you ever think about the fact that as creative people with the Adobe Creative Suite, we can make or destroy things like no big deal? You have the tools, which is amazing. And thanks to like the internet, you could literally ruin your entire life in like two minutes. <laughs> you could tweet one sentence and like never get a job again. I don't recommend doing that for many reasons, but just the fact that we have that much power, each of us as people, to do amazing good and also terrible, terrible bad things is overwhelming. It is literally terrifying. And because I love a joke and I'm super literal, pencils are literally tools and weapons. You can write an entire book in pencil. I recently did that, again, just to make this joke better. I literally hand wrote a 13 chapter book in pencil. No one asked me to. <laughs> but also, and this is good if you're ever in an unsafe situation, you can murder someone with a pencil. You're gonna want it to be pretty sharp. You're gonna go behind them, puncture through the back. If you pop a lung, they'll die. So, pro tip, I mean, hopefully you'll never need to know that. But, but a pencil itself is uh, a tool or a weapon. So if you ever see someone with a pencil on their ear, pretending that they're like in a hurry, just watch out. Because you know, if people are actually busy, they're using a pen, it's just faster. Do it yourself and see how it goes. So that's, that's the point, is that I just showed you a bunch of projects that I really like, that are funny, that are cute to me. Some of them have been sold at Urban Outfitters <laughs> and other places. Some of them have earned me a lot of money, which is crazy, that t-shirt, for example. Uh, some things I just made a lot of pencils and nobody asked for them. But there was no boss. There was no one who had to approve that. There was no one who had to give me permission to do that. Um, there was a barrier of entry financially, absolutely. I will say that at the time that I made those first balloons, I probably had like $200 in my bank account. And I just like spent $120 making those balloons. But then some of the balloons sold and then I was able to print zines. And so all that stuff that I've made really stemmed from just one creative project. And before balloons, before zines was a single postcard print. That's how it started for me was a postcard. And it's, it's very much a something from nothing mentality where like do one thing, make a little bit of money, put it back into the thing and slowly grow. And there's no boss and there's no one who can tell you no because you're not asking for permission anyway. It doesn't matter. And I always think about, I'm not like super, super religious anymore, but I always think about this one part in the Old Testament where Harry, Ron, and Hermione are going to the Chamber of Secrets. Um, I forget which book that is. They're in the Chamber of Secrets and they fall down into this like tangly uh, green vines and Hermione Granger, girl genius. Sidebar, why did they flat iron our hair in the movie? Where is our like curly haired hero? I wear a baseball hat for a reason, and I was really looking to see myself represented on screen. <laughs> That's not really a problem that I have actually. We can talk about that outside. Um, Hermione Granger, who's a genius, she's like, oh, that's the devil's snare. So I need a, I need a light a fire to get us out of this mess, but there's no wood. Hermione Granger, girl genius, there's no wood for a fire. And Ronald Weasley, sidebar, what happened to Rupert Grant's career? <laughs> Daniel Radcliffe. Rupert Grant. Daniel Radcliffe, Rupert Grant. That's not fair. Ron Weasley bellowed, actual word choice, thank you JK Rowling, bellowed. Ron bellows, are you a witch or not? Are you a witch or not? Are you not like the smartest witch in the whole, in the whole class? Are you not a magical woman with a fucking wand? You do not need wood to make a fire when you're a fucking witch. So I have to ask you, a room of people who are studying at an art school, who have the creative suite, illegal or otherwise, who have Google Drive. You know when I was in school, we would have to get like Microsoft Office for Mac. 
you would have to like one person paid for it and would just give it to like a 